This morning, I want to speak to you about the topic of adoption. And uh, we're going to look at two passages in the Bible to help us as a spring, springboard to speak about adoption. We're going to look at Luke 15, and we're going to look at Galatians 4. So I'm going to jump right in, and I'm going to start reading from Luke 15, verse 11. Now, this, the context of these verses is Jesus speaking to a large crowd. And really, at the beginning of chapter 15, we kind of get the sense that Jesus is showing people who the Father is because they've misunderstood him all along. And so he, he says this parable to try to get the people to understand who the Father really is. And he says in Luke 11, 15, 11, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate but no one gave, gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, look, these many years I've served you, I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. And then I'm going to skip forward to Galatians 4, just a few verses. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. I love the gospel. I love the good news about who Jesus is. Sometimes I think as Christians, we can reduce what Jesus has done, who Jesus is, his work on the cross and resurrection to an issue of morality, to an issue of behavior modification, where we treat the cross and resurrection like it's some sort of ginormous washing machine, putting bad people in so that they can come out good, putting dirty people in so that they can come out clean, but if we reduce the gospel to an issue of morality, we've totally misunderstood what the gospel is about because I want to tell you the gospel is not an issue of morality. It's an issue of sonship. God the Father is not primarily a holy God making bad people good. He's primarily a father God making orphans into sons. So I want to say to you this morning, you, this may be news to you. You might be thinking, I've sat in churches my whole life and I never understood this. God is not interested in making you good. God is interested in making you whole. 
He's interested in bringing you into his family, into bringing you into belonging, into bringing you into sonship. And if you like technical theological words, so often as Christians we stop as ju at justification rather than understanding that the Bible preaches adoption as the end point of what God wants to do. He's not just interested in making you clean, in making you good, in making you moral. He's interested in bringing you home and in giving you not only a sense of belonging as a son, but in giving you the responsibility of being an heir of his kingdom. That's what the gospel is about. And this story that we read in Luke 15 tells us of two sons who were sons, who belonged in a family, but really dis didn't understand sonship at all. And so how they lived looked more like orphans than it did like sonship. And as Christians, we can so often live more like orphans than the sons and daughters God has created us to be. Listen, when you put your faith in Jesus, when you say to Jesus, I wanna lean on you, I put all my weight on you, I believe that you are God and you are good and I want you to have my whole life, you become a Christian. You are in, you belong. And in that moment, the Bible tells us that the spirit of sonship comes, up, comes upon you. It's the Holy Spirit who allows us to come close and to belong to God as our Father. But we can live as if we're orphans even when we've been made sons. And so what I wanna look at very specifically this morning is this issue of being adopted into the family of God. The Holy Spirit, the Bible tells us, is the spirit of adoption. And so this morning we're gonna look at what seismic change the Holy Spirit wants to bring into our lives so that we who are sons and daughters will really live like we're sons and daughters and no longer as orphans. And so we're gonna look at a few things that this story shows us. First thing I wanna pull out is their relationship with the father. The younger son, he sees the father as a means to an end. That's all the father is to him. At the beginning of the story, the younger son says to the father, give me the inheritance that's coming to me. Now, we might not think that's a huge thing to say, but in Jewish culture, that was incredibly offensive. You never ever asked for an early inheritance because that meant that you were saying to your father, I wish you were dead. And so for the son, the father is not an issue. He doesn't really care what happens to the father. What he cares about is the money. You you are my means to an end, you are my means to money. And notice when the younger son suddenly comes to himself in the middle of the story, it's not because he suddenly realizes, oh my gosh, what am I doing? I've broken my father's heart. No, it's because his belly is rumbling. His father is still the means to an end, it's just this time it's food right? And he's not all that repentant. Sometimes we make this like he's super repentant. You know, if he was super repentant, he would be thinking to come back to the father as a slave because a slave cannot leave. But he's not thinking to come back as a slave. He's thinking to come back as a hired servant because he's still not understanding who the father is. He's still his means to an end. I like to call this the God plus something mentality. I love Jesus when it's Jesus and I'm healthy. I love Jesus when it's Jesus and I have enough in the bank. I love Jesus when it's Jesus and I'm seeing the miracles I long for. Get the point? God plus month is something. But you know who really is your God when you take the plus something away? Because if the father doesn't look so good anymore, I wanna suggest that maybe the God is the plus something, not the God at the beginning of the sentence. We'll know if this is us, we'll know if we're living in this way, if every time something happens, God and how we view him changes in our, in our understanding. With, uh, every change of our health, with every change of our finances, with every change of our circumstances, if the understanding of the goodness of God in your view gets shaken, maybe it's time to look at the God plus something mentality. Is the Father your means to an end? Because you know, if, if we're living like that, we're settling for far 
too little. It's not that we're asking for too much, it's that we haven't understood just how glorious he is because the Father is the prize. He's not the means to an end. You know, he's so kind that he often blesses us with all the other things too, but the reality is take everything else away. He is still the worthy prize. And I love it because the Apostle Paul talks about the contentment that comes from understanding who God is. And he talks about how he's content in riches and in poverty, in sickness and in health. He he lists all these different opposites and says how he's found the secret to contentment. If you want to know the secret to contentment this morning, I want to tell you it's understanding that the Father is the prize because the Father is always with you. See, adoption radically changes changes our ability to be content because we get into relationship with the Father and everything changes for us because he really is that good. The older son also has a funny relationship with the Father. He sees him as a master. He's working really hard to earn something and we can see that because when the party's thrown for the younger son, the older son is like, I've done all the things that you asked me to do. I have earned a party, haven't I? The problem with seeing the father as a master is that it leads to entitlement because we're counting up all of the things that were done as if counting makes a difference. See, it's really good news that he's not counting and neither should we be. He's not your master, he's your father. And the tragedy of this is that the father had already given all the favor to the older son that the older son was busy trying to earn. I've always been with you, all I have is yours. Here you are asking for a goat and I'm saying to you, all I have is yours. Why have you been busy trying to earn something that in relationship I give you freely? I love the Galatians 4 verses because they show us how adoption changes how we relate to the Father, no longer as a means to an end, no longer as a master, but he's now our Abba. The first time we see that word used, Jesus uses it of the Father. See, it's a word of closeness, a word of intimacy. It's, it's like daddy, but adults in the Jewish day would use it. It's, it's a word of utter um, trust and closeness in relationship. The beautiful thing about what Holy Spirit does for you and I is that he brings us into the same relationship, exactly the same relationship that Jesus has with the Father. So the closeness and the intimacy that Jesus has with the Father, you and I get to have because adoption changes everything. The place that Jesus occupies in the Trinity you and I get to occupy in the Trinity. Now think about that. That's gonna mess with your brain a little bit. But I promise you, it's what the Bible says. Ephesians says that we've been joined with him, we've been seated in him, Christ, at the right hand of the Father. You and I, if you're a Christian, we're not actually here, even though we're here, but there's a greater reality of where we are, and it's seated on a throne in heaven with Jesus. Because where he occupies in heavenly places, you and I occupy in heavenly places. Julian often talks about it as we are Siamese twins with Jesus. We share the same heart. You are inseparable from who Jesus is and the relationship that he has with the Father, the closeness, the trust, the hearing what the Father says, you and I get to walk in. Adoption also radically changes our relationship with the law. Now, Galatians talks about how Jesus came to redeem those who were held captive under the law. The older son was captive to the law. The law is a system of rules where you feel that you have to do right and be right. And the law is perfect. So that's a problem for us because I don't know if you've noticed, but humans don't tend to be very good at being perfect. And so the law holds us hostage if we try to live by it because we're forever on this treadmill of striving to do right and to be right. We need to keep the rules for ourselves, but when other people break the rules, we struggle because we have to be right. So we often choose being right over relationships 
relationship, which is how unforgiveness works. And so the law holds this older son captive. You know why he's so angry to see his brother being celebrated? Because he's a law keeper. And under Jewish law in Deuteronomy, it said rebellious sons should be stoned. And you know, so when the father receives him back and the servant comes and tells the older brother what's going on, what's the party, what's happening, and the servant says the fattened calf has been killed because your father received your brother back safe and sound. That doesn't mean, isn't it great that your younger brother came back healthy, that means, isn't it great that your father showed him mercy? We need to understand the radical nature of what the father did, because when the father saw the younger son at a distance, the reason that the father started running wasn't just because he thought, I've missed you so much, but it was because he understood that he needed to get to his son before the son got to the city. So he lifts up his robes, because you need to do that when you're running, and he starts running, which would be incredibly humiliating for an older man in Jewish culture. But he doesn't care. He's running through the streets and he's running and he's running and all the time he's thinking, get to my son before the son gets to the city and before he's stoned. If anyone else had received that rebellious son back, they would have known what the rules said they should do. And so the older son, who's a rule keeper, who's captured by the law, cannot understand it. You know, the beautiful thing about the gospel is that the book of Hebrews tells us that Jesus is our older brother, but he speaks a better word over you and I. He's not an older brother demanding justice under the law for what you and I have done but he is one with the Father, handing out mercy and grace in lavish measure. Adoption radically changes our relationship with the law because Galatians tells us we're no longer under the law, captive to it, but we've been redeemed by Jesus so that we have now come into the one who has perfectly fulfilled the law. You've already got 100% on the exam, the law has been fulfilled, you no longer live in the realm of law. Now some of you are looking at me and thinking, I'm not Jewish, what what do I care about the law? Let me tell you something about what it looks like for us to live in the realm of law even if we don't understand it. The realm of the law is a system based entirely on justice. You get what you deserve. The problem is what we deserve under the law because we're not perfect is death and punishment and penalty. The devil loves the realm of the law because it's a system where he gets to consistently accuse us. And the Bible tells us that he is the ultimate accuser. He loves it when Christians start deciding that they need to be rule keepers rather than understanding that they've been brought into the gospel of grace. Now that doesn't mean we use our freedom for sin because the book of 1 Peter says, you who've now been free, don't follow the counterfeit of freedom, which is evil. When you've truly been made free, you don't need to give in to sin because when you've been free, your nature has been changed so that it's more natural for you not to sin than to sin. But the devil, if he can get us living in the system of the law where we feel like we need to strive to follow the laws, follow the rules, where we believe that Christianity is an issue primarily of morality rather than our identity, then he sucks us into a realm where everything is based on justice for what you've done, you get what you deserve, and he can go wild with accusation. There are Christians who struggle with accusing thoughts all of the time. They don't know why they're hearing all of this stuff in their head. And I wanna suggest one reason might be that you're living in the realm of law without even understanding it. You might be a Christian who's been created to live in the realm of grace, but if you have started to rely on the rules to make you feel like you're getting things right, then you have voluntarily sucked yourself back into a realm of law, which leaves you open to the accusation of the enemy. And one way you can suck yourself back into the realm of law is through unforgiveness. 
You know, when the Bible tells us to forgive, it's not for the benefit of the one who, for, who you forgive, it's for the benefit of you. Because unforgiveness only operates if you believe in being right over relationship, which means you live in the realm of law if you live in unforgiveness. The enemy loves that because he doesn't want you to live in the realm of grace, grace towards you and grace towards others. And so if he can get us to live in unforgiveness, he knows that he'll suck us into a realm of law because you can't live in two different realms. You can't insist that someone else gets what they deserve when you're trying to live in the realm of grace for yourself. And so I wanna say to you today, if you're struggling with unforgiveness, let it go. This isn't to belittle what's been done to you, to deny the pain of what's happened. Some of you have lived through horrific things. I'm not belittling what's been done, but I'm saying to you, if you wanna live in the fullness of the grace that God has for you, you have to let it go so that you can live in the realm of grace. And when you're living in the realm of grace, when the enemy comes to you and tells you you're a loser and you're rubbish and you're just never good enough, you can point him in the realm of grace to a beautiful cross where Jesus died. And you can say, no, no, you don't understand because I've been joined with Jesus and I died with Jesus and he's overcome you. So any accusation cannot stick. The realm of grace is an incredibly slippery realm for any accusation. It cannot stick to you. And so adoption radically changes our understanding of the law because we no longer live in that realm. We've been invited to live in the realm of grace. One more thing on this. I wonder as Christians if we sound more like the accusing devil than the gracious father. I wonder if as Christians we, we read this story and we actually may sound to the world more like the older brother than the father. I wonder if with our placards we sound more like the older brother than we do the father, talking about things that we don't agree with rather than welcoming people into belonging into a family before we address the issues of their morality. Because last time I checked, you and I didn't get in because of our morality, we got in because he's kind. In the book of Ephesians, there's this beautiful verse in Ephesians 4 that talks about speaking the truth in love to one another. And Christians have used that verse as an excuse to criticize with a smile. And the person in front of you has to kind of take it because you did say, I'm speaking the truth in love to you. You've quoted scripture. They're powerless to do anything about it. The problem with that kind of thinking is that it reduces truth to an idea rather than the perfect description of what truth is in the Bible, which is a person called Jesus. When we speak the truth in love to one another, what you and I are actually doing is speaking Christ-likeness over one another. What we're doing is we're saying, I see Jesus in you and this is what he looks like. And you can do this all around in your church and outside because every single human being on the planet was made in the image of God. Every Every single human being on the planet has the gold seed of God in them. And so we get the privilege of pulling out that gold, of saying, I see what Jesus created you for. That's what speaking the truth in love to one another really means. I wonder who you and I sound like. Who do you wanna be in the story? Because the Father's inviting us to be sons and daughters who understand his heart. If the older son understood the Father, he'd be out there looking for the younger. Who do we get to be? Being sons and daughters radically changes us. Let's talk about honor for a second. I know you've talked about honor in a series that you've done in this church already. Paul uses the word adoption in the passage that we read in Galatians, and he uses the word adoption in three of his letters to three different churches, to Ephesus, to Rome, and to the church in Galatia. He uses it in these contexts which are under Roman jurisdiction because he understands that they will understand the word adoption according to a Roman lens because they're all in Roman contexts. In Roman context, the word 
Adoption meant three things. Firstly, it was irreversible. Once you'd gone through the process of adoption, there was no going back. There was no changing your mind if you were the child or an adult because adult adoptions were often done. Whoever you were who was adopted into a family, you could not change your mind and neither could the parents who adopted you. It was utterly irreversible. The second thing about adoption was that in the Roman context, it was a means by which power was passed on from one in power to one who he wanted to bestow power to. So if, at the time that Paul was writing his letters, in fact, there had been, uh, of the six previous emperors before him, four, em four emperors had adopted an adult in order to pass on their power to an adopted son rather than their biological children. At the same time, in the current context of Galatia, the emperor Claudius had adopted Nero in order to pass on his power. So, adoption was irreversible. Adoption was a means by which you could pass on all of your power to somebody else. And thirdly, adoption was a means of passing on honor. In the ancient world, whose you were was much more important than who you were. Who you belonged to was much more important. The question would be, what family do you come from? So any achievement that you could get by being an amazing soldier or an incredible scholar would always pale in significance in comparison to someone who came from an honorable family because who you belonged to always trumped what you had achieved. This has radical connotations for you and I in the body of Christ because God has chosen to adopt us irreversibly. He's chosen to adopt us so that he can pass on all of the power that he has to you and I by his spirit. And he's chosen to adopt us so that you and I no longer need to strive for some level of significance like the sons in the parable did. But you and I, in understanding what it means to be adopted as sons and daughters, understand that God has bestowed the honor due his name to you and I. So so that we don't need to strive for achievement in the church. We understand that we have been ascribed with significance because of the honor that adoption brings. Isn't it crazy that God, in his incredible kindness, would choose to bring us into his family, would choose to lavish us with the power that courses through him himself, and would choose to give on us the honor that is due his name. It's a beautiful, radical shift that comes when we understand adoption. Another thing to think about, inheritance. Orphans don't get inheritance. The younger son is grabbing at it, hoping that he can get his hands on something. The older son is guarding his inheritance. Not only was the older son irritated when the younger son came back because he was a law keeper, but he was irritated because of an issue of inheritance. Let's think about this for a second. If at the beginning of the story, the father halves his estate in order to give the younger son his inheritance, whose calf robe, ring, etc., is being used when the younger son returns. The older son's inheritance, right? So everything from this point onwards in the story has shifted for the older son because he is now watching his inheritance being used. Sometimes as Christians, it's like there isn't enough to go round. We act like we've got to somehow guard my platform. There better be no one else in this church who can teach because I'm the teacher in this church. There better be no one else who has a testimony of prophecy because I'm the one who prophesies. There better be no one else who gets a job raise or uh, the promotion that they were wait waiting for because I've been praying for that. As if there isn't enough to go around, as if resources in the kingdom have uh, come into some kind of restricted budget and we've all got to come and beg at the crumbs of Jesus for anything that he might give us. <laughs> Heaven's not in a recession and neither are we. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you, you and I get to be liberal with the inheritance he's given us because there's more than enough.
There is more than enough of the miraculous provision of God. There's more than enough of the miraculous healing that God wants to bring to your community. When you see someone else with a testimony that you need of your breakthrough, rejoice because the word testimony means to do again. Testimonies are prophetic in nature. So we don't need to guard the tiny bit of ground that we're standing on. We get to invite everybody else into play and to celebrate and we get to share everything. Isn't it incredible? that your older brother Jesus isn't annoyed that the father has given you a share of his inheritance but is open-handed saying come come there is more than enough you don't need to scrimp and scrape and save to somehow make it there is inheritance in the kingdom the very same inheritance that Jesus enjoys is yours and mine there is more than enough for everybody to come in and enjoy the the incredible resource of the kingdom. Not one day when we died, incidentally, when, he di when we die, incidentally, but open to us when he died. That's what it means to live in the resource of heaven because heaven isn't a reality when you die. Heaven is a coexistent reality right now with earth and it's breaking in on everything that we know and we see. You get to live in the resource of the kingdom now. And you know the beautiful thing about inheritance? Is that sons don't work for it. Fathers work so that sons can receive inheritance. You and I don't need to be working hard to prove ourselves worthy of the inheritance of the kingdom. He's done the work so that you and I get to walk in and receive what isn't cheap but is for free. He's just that kind. Last one, the party. When we understand adoption, we understand where joy and pleasure is to be found completely <coughs> differently. Both the sons are looking for a party. The younger son is a little bit more obvious. He takes the money so that he can go somewhere because he's looking for pleasure outside of his father's house, right? The older son, he's got this whole veneer of, I don't need the party, I'm better than that. I'm much more interested in the rules, but actually it all comes out at the end, doesn't it? When he says, you know, all this time I've been serving you, you never even gave me a goat so I could celebrate with my friends. The party is still elsewhere. He just didn't have the guts to own up to the fact that he wanted to find joy and pleasure. But what's crazy is that the father throws such a party that the older son comes back from the fields and he can't even recognize the sound, it's so insane. To him, it's so alien. He thought he understood what pleasure would look like. The party the father throws is a completely different thing. It's so much wilder, it's so much better. Because I wanna tell you, the father is the ultimate party thrower. You and I might be looking and hungry for joy and pleasure. The beauty of the gospel is that it doesn't say looking for pleasure is wrong. It just shows you where to find the ultimate pleasure. The lie of sin is that it's giving you pleasure that you can't find elsewhere. The truth of the gospel is God hates sin because it's settling for far too little pleasure. When we look at the parables so often, as with the parables in Luke 15, the invitation is come and enter the master's joy. In the previous two parables in Luke 15, that's the, that's the culmination of the story. In Luke 15, in this passage, come and enter the party. You know, this lost son parable is in, written in two halves in the original text. The first half comes to a conclusion with the younger son entering into the party. The second half is intentionally left open. The last sentence is missing because as Jesus was telling the parable to his Jewish listeners, he was leaving it open ended to them what they would do as the older sons. It's open ended for you and I. The father is inviting us to enter his joy. That's what it means to be sons and daughters, to live a life so extravagant in joy. One Peter says that your joy would be inexpressible. It's like laughing so hysterically, you can't get your words out. Someone's like, tell me what's funny. 
No, no, tell me what was fun. <laughs> Ever laughed like that? Well, you're crying with laughter. You just can't. The laughter just keeps going. And someone is really annoyingly trying to get you to explain. And you're like, I can't breathe, let alone tell you the words. That's what you're invited into in the kingdom. Regardless of your context, regardless of your plus something being there or not. Why don't you just stand with me for a minute?